So everybody has to help out. We can't just say, Boyana, go get us more students, because, uh, you know, well, we tried that, but uh, <laughs> uh, we also need to do everything else better, is uh, the short answer. Everything else is the way we market the university, the communications campaigns, but also, you know, how good the product is, how well our faculty teach, how interesting the courses are, how good the jobs our alumni get. Everything has to be better if we want to be more attracted to more students. Uh, move forward again. Okay, here's, here's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you might want to duck because I don't want to zap you with, with my laser beams here. Um, <coughs> okay, here's the actual history of how many students apply, how many we admit, and how many we enroll. And uh, we want to get about 300 students every year. That will take us up to about 1,200. Maybe 350 would be better because it would get us closer to 1,400. Um, if you see where we've been, there's a few years where we were close to 300. The last couple of years, it's closer to 200, and that's why we're running behind. Uh, looking at where the yellow line is, um, that drop in number of students admitted is because we've actually tightened up the admission standards in the last two years. It has become harder to get in, so if you're concerned that I want now to lower standards, uh, right there is where I became provost and when the number of admitted students went down because we, ch we <laughs> raised the standards, actually. And when I became the director. And when Boriana became the director of admissions. Yeah, that was my second thing I did when I became provost <laughs> is I hired a new admissions director. Uh, the proportion of students we admit who actually come is actually pretty good. We'll see that in a second. But so if we want more students to enroll, you know, now you look at the top line, we have to get more students to apply. Uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, we can't get more students to come here unless we admit more students without lowering standards. Unless we admit more students, we can't admit more students without lowering standards unless we get more students to apply. So the trick is to get more students to apply. So this still isn't working, sorry. Next slide. Okay, the percentage of admitted students who enroll. Uh, I've got the biggest gallery of students I've had a chance to ask, so I'm going to ask you a personal question right now. If you can think back to when you were applying, how many schools did you apply to? Four or more? Several, okay. So if you apply to four or more among those schools you applied to, only 25% or so of you actually enrolled in, right? Because you applied to four or five, you only enrolled in one. How many applied to three? Two? One? See, this number always blows my mind. <laughs> I, and I think it's because AEBG's application deadlines are before other places. So you apply to AEBG, you find out about AEBG, and then you don't apply. See? Yes. Okay. Th that reassures me a little bit. But uh, this percentage has been sliding for several years, but it's still pretty high. I mean, it's higher than... In the U.S., 23% is the average. You know, four to five schools you apply to, 20 to 25% actually get you. Uh, we're over 50% and staying there, but it's, I think it's unrealistic to think, I don't know what's going on here, that's crazy. <laughs> um, but we're never going to go back there. We're never going to get 80% of the students we admit actually to enroll, that's crazy. So if we're over 50% and we're not getting enough students, it's because <coughs> we don't have enough applicants. Okay? Next slide. Okay, so why don't we have enough applicants? Uh, these red bars that you see sliding down, that's the number of Bulgarian students studying in the USA. Back in 2005 to 2007, that's when we were getting over 200 Bulgarian students a year. There were over 3,000 Bulgarian students studying in the US, which means every year there's 800 to 1,000 students graduating from Bulgarian schools applying to schools in the U.S. and if you apply to a school in the U.S. you got to take that stupid SAT and therefore uh, we have a chance to convince you to say well you know consider AEBG also and then a lot of those students would come. That's when we were hitting two, over 200 Bulgarian students a year but look at what's happening to the number of Bulgarian students in the U.S. It's fallen by more than half. So the pool of those easy, I don't want to say victims, that's all right, Targets, that doesn't sound right either. Uh, <laughs> potential clients, <laughs> that pool of clients is shrinking. Uh, where are they going? Okay, uh, the yellow bars that you see also dropping, that's the number of official SAT test takers in Bulgaria. 
2011, the number wasn't zero. We just forgot to grab that number when it was published. So we don't, don't know what it was, but I'm willing to bet it's something in between 2010 and 2012. Look at what's happening to the number of SAT test takers. It was close to 2,000 back in 2005, 2,000 per year, and now it's down to a couple hundred. It's dropped by 70, 80 percent. That's the pool of people that we can convince to come here. Because you can't come, if we require the SAT, and that's the size of the pool of people willing to take the SAT, that's the size of the pool of people from which we've got to meet our admission target. It doesn't look pretty. Okay, next one. Oh, I'm sorry, go back for a second. The green bars that are going up off the chart, that's UK. So that's where they're going. Uh, similar pattern for Denmark, Germany, Netherlands. Uh, off the top of the chart. The thing is, schools in Europe do not use the SAT. So uh, the, the, stu the students who we used to recruit, good in English, good schools in Bulgaria, used to be applying to schools in the USA, would be signing up to take the SAT because that's something they had to do. I now do not need to take the SAT because they're not looking at America, they're looking elsewhere. They're looking in Europe. Next one. So. <coughs> This is the 2011 is again because we're missing the data, but if you take that pool of uh, SAT test takers and uh, you divide the number of Bulgarian students who are coming to AUBG by that potential pool of test takers, you can see that 2005, 2006, 2007, I don't want to, I don't want to decapitate student government here, but um, <laughs> Here's when we were getting over 200 Bulgarian students per year. We could get by with 12 or 13 percent of the SAT test takers. Great. You know. Past year, 45 percent of the pool came to AEBG, and we only have half as many Bulgarian students as we need. Can we get 90 percent of the pool? I don't think so. That seems unlikely. Next slide, please. So, uh, the process, if you're applying to college, if we think our typical applicant is also thinking about applying in the USA, uh, if you're thinking of applying in the USA, the first thing you do is look up how much they charge for tuition and you reel in shock and then you faint and you hit the floor and so forth. Recover, uh, you submit your forms, you take the SAT, you file your financial aid applications, you do all that stuff. For AUBG, everything is exactly the same. So therefore, when our, uh, the students we're trying to attract, are also looking at U.S. schools. All we're really asking them to do is fill out one more form, one more envelope, one more stamp, and we're in the pool. And that gives us the chance to convince them that maybe they should come to AEBG instead of going to, you know, Ithaca College or Bates or whatever it is they're applying to. Next slide. So, uh, yeah, so everything's good as long as our target students are looking at the USA. Next. Uh, but if they're looking in the UK, uh, you know, some shock but not so bad because Scotland is still free and plus they have the loans you don't pay back as long as you stay unemployed. Um, <laughs> you know, you submit your application form, your transcript, your TOEFL, and then you wait to hear what the result is. You know, some of them contact you again and they want you to show up to take a supplemental test and this and that, but at that point, for the most part, you're done with the applications. You wait to see what the result is. For AEBG, you've got to do all this other stuff. And the other stuff that you have to do only for AEBG matters hugely because it determines how much you're going to be asked to pay, whether or not you get in, what kind of result you have. Therefore, you can't just say, oh, oh damn, it's that Saturday, I've got to go take that test. No, you have to actually have to prepare for it for some weeks and months in advance. And so, next slide, uh, you can skip all that hassle if you don't apply to AEBG. You don't have to take the SAT prep course. You don't have to worry about weekends. You don't have to get up at 7 in the morning to go get to Black Oak to take the test. You don't have to do any of that stuff. So um, that means when our students are looking at Europe and not the USA, the SAT is a big barrier to us getting those applicants. That's why we're thinking about that. So next. Um, we think that. Uh, AUBG, based on price, and this is going to be a tough sell to this audience, I know, but we think for the student who's comparing, coming here to going to the UK, if it comes down to cost, we're going to win because tuition is 9,000 pounds most places in the UK, and that's even before you talk about your dorm room, which is another 10,000 pounds, and turn that back into dollars, and you're talking about a big bill. 
Uh, but if they don't apply to AUBG, they never make that comparison. We're out even before the game starts. So we need to get them to apply before we can start to convince them. Next. So there are some good schools in the UK. They, there are some places that manage to admit only good students. It, it must be possible. They don't use the SAT. It must be possible to be done because some schools do it. So uh, we look at what else could we look at. Next. Uh, which do we believe? If you have a better SAT score, that means you're a better person and, you know, better, stronger, faster, better looking, etc. Uh, does a better score make you a better person? Yeah. Or does a better score make it more likely that you'll be successful here and that's why we should be more willing to admit you? No, no. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, none of the above. If, if my students are here, they say, well, I'm waiting for none of the above. Okay. So, if we think number two is right, we should stick with the SAT if all these things are true. Test score, re re strong and reliable predictor of your, how well you do at AUBG. If we're using that because we want to say we only want to admit students who are going to be successful here, and a student who can't be successful here, we don't want to ruin their lives by saying, yeah, come, come here so we can take all your money and then flunk you out. Uh, that's not the kind of institution we want to be. So what we want to do is admit everybody who is going to be a good student and somebody who isn't likely to be a good student, we want to say, yeah, maybe this isn't the right place for you. But that should be the dividing line. In order to do that, we need something that's going to predict whether or not you're going to be successful here. Uh, so we should rely on the SAT if it does that job, and if nothing else can do as well, and if the SAT score doesn't stop us from getting applicants, if, and if once you take the SAT once, you can't take it six more times to try to get a better score. And when I actually look at the data, I see exactly that happening. Uh, and uh, when we make our scholarship offers, our financial aid offers, we are you know, aligning what we do with what the comp competition is doing. And so when our students were applying to the USA, the USA colleges are looking at the SAT scores and they're going to give some sort of offer based on the SAT score, we're doing the same thing. If, your school, if our applicants are applying to Europe and they're looking at different things, then our, our giving scholarships and financial aid based on the SAT score means that we're listening to some different drummer. Next. So, how well does it actually predict performance? You tell me. Uh, this is Bulgarian students entering in fall 2013. Uh, on the vertical scale is their first year's cumulative grade point average at AEBG. Bottom scale is the SAT test total. How strong is that correlation to you? Almost everybody who took the SAT has at least somewhat good GPA, different than zero. Well, uh, <laughs> I said almost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I said almost everybody. Almost everybody is better than zero, right? Yes. Yes. The next one is patient with zero GPA. I am zero. zero GPA means you failed every single course. Yeah. Uh, I suspect. Uh, the way you fail every single course is not to show up to any class for the entire semester and then not show up to your exams either. Probably because the person never really wanted to be here in the first place. That's my guess. Okay? I mean, regardless of what your SAT score is, if you don't want to be here and you never show up to any classes, you're going to get all less. Okay? But, so, I mean, even ignoring these two people. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, R square is 0 0.016, that means the SAT score can predict about 16% of the variation in grades. Okay, meh. Yeah. All right, next. International students, what do you see? Even better. Yeah, even better, 0 0.01. <laughs> that is as close to worthless as you're ever going to get. <laughs> okay, I'll be fair. Uh, in fall 2013, we did not admit anybody who didn't score over 1,000 on the SAT. So what this tells us is that among students who score above 1,000 on the SAT, the SAT score does not help us predict how well you do in your first year. That doesn't mean that if we admit students with 600 SAT that they would do just as well. So we might see the uh, prediction power emerge if we started admitting students with much lower scores. But at least among the scores that we define decide are acceptable, there's not much predictive power there. Next. Uh, fall 2012 is more interesting because uh, that was bef 
before we tightened up the standards so we have a sort of a wider pool of uh, applicant quality to look at. Uh, it's hard to see in these lights, but there's a red, I can, I can zap it out for you. Right there's the regression line in case you're wondering if there is a trend. There it is right there. Um, we're looking at only first year cumulative grade point average because if your grades suddenly turn crummy in your senior year, I'm tough to convince me that it's because you weren't well prepared to enter AUBG. You know, that, that your, your poor preparation was still good enough to allow you to get good grades in your freshman, sophomore, and junior years, but not in your senior year. I think if your grades go down in your senior year, it's probably because something about you or, you know, your interest in studying or whatever is happening, but not how well prepared you were to enter this university. So we're looking at first year cumulative grade point average. Um, again, R squared, 0 0.20, yeah, not great, next. So, performance of the SAT score to predict how well you do, meh, okay, not that good. And uh, the one thing that we used to really rely on is why we had to keep it is because we say, oh, but we admit students from Albania and Mongolia and Kazakhstan, how are we gonna compare who's a good student, who's a not, from all these different places, well, at least the SAT score is the same test for everybody, but it doesn't do the same thing for everybody. It don't get the same results for Bulgarian students as you get from international students. We never really thought of that before until we actually looked at it. Next. Is there an alternative? There has to be because uh, there's all these European universities that have been in business for some time and some of them are good. So they figured it out. Um, a lot of uh, US colleges have moved away from SAT requirements. There's about 800 of them now that do not ask you to do not require you to submit one of these tests. Duquesne University in Pennsylvania just made the same decision the same weekend. Um, so what else could we look at? Uh, we know that applicants still submit TOEFL scores and we have uh, a numerical measure of your high school GPA. Next. Um, so we developed a weighted average that we try to, using regression analysis, to see whether or not it can predict how well students do using these other measures that we have at hand. Maintaining that same minimum TOEFL score, so we are not lowering the standard at all in that regard. Let me say that again, we are not lowering the standard at all in that regard. Um, so admission points. Uh, if we set the minimum uh, at around, and I'm not sure it's 4,200 is exactly, but, but something like 4,000 to 4,200 admission points sets the level of selectivity among the applicant pool at almost exactly as, as close as we can estimate the same level as the 1,000 SAT. So, next. So, how well do we, can we predict? Here's one of our predictors uh, for fall 2013 entering students. Predictor A, and I've scrambled up the scale so you can't easily tell which one is SAT and which one is not. So, predictor A, uh, is that good? Well, okay, let's look at the next one. Or that one. Which one do you like? A or B? Uh, if you look at the very bottom, you see the R squared. That one wants to help you. This one's 0.43. The other one is 0.37, I think it was. This one is point, yeah, 0 0.38, 0 0.43. So B looks like it's a bit better. Okay, next. Uh, concern among some of the trustees of whether or not the alternative could be used across different populations of different countries. So I said, okay, our two biggest single other countries, aside from Bulgaria, is Albania and Russia. So I looked at Albania, Albanian students entering in fall 2012, measure A, measure B, which do you want? Okay, next. Russian students, fall 2012, A, 0.26, B, 0.35. Okay, next. Uh, Bulgarian students, a, 0.53, that's pretty good. B, 57, even better. <laughs> Next. Weaker one was the SAT. A was the SAT, B is the admission points. Every population I've looked at, the admission points are close to, in fact, every single one I've looked at so far, it's a little bit better than, but I'm not gonna bet my paycheck on that, but close to as good as the SAT. Um, sometimes the differences aren't large, admit that. Uh, low admission points are a stronger warning signal of poor performance on a low SAT score. 
Uh, in the past, we have admitted some students with SATs below 1,000. Uh, I could look back and see what their admission points would be. Their admission points are okay. They did okay. We've also admitted students with perfectly good SATs but low admission points. Guess what happens? They don't do so good. So low admission points seems to be a stronger predictor of who's going to be in trouble. Um, admission points seem to do a pretty good job across nationalities groups, more so than the SAT does. Uh, and even among the best groups, uh, last week uh, somebody asked me, well, what about scholarship awards? Uh, this is just another numerical way of ranking students' academic records, just like the SAT is. Uh, for scholarship awards, we can give them to the top admission points applicants instead of the top SAT applicants. I was able to go back and look at uh, the performance of, uh, I think in 2013, we admitted 30, 31 full scholarship students based on SAT scores. I went back and pulled out the top 31 students based on admission points. Guess which group got better grades? Admission points. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, in case you're wondering, in case you're afraid, it turns out that admission points and SAT scores are pretty closely aligned with each other. So, uh, actually the red lines came up pretty well in this thing. Every time I transfer this file to a different graph, the lines shift a little bit. So. It's not, it's by mistake. That's supposed to be over 1,000 SAT. Here's all the applicants for this fall, even the ones who did not enroll at AUPG. So every applicant is a dot. Quadrant one is people who got over 1,000 SAT and over 4,200 admission points. Almost everybody over 1,000 SAT also had enough admission points. Almost everybody with enough admission points had over 1,000 SAT. The two measures give you the same admit, do not admit decision about 80% of the time. Uh, quadrant three are people that we would not reject, we would not accept under either one. Uh, the two interesting cases are where the two measures give us different recommendations. Quadrant two are people who have good SAT scores, but their admission points are not so good. Uh, you see a lot of dots in there because we weren't looking at admission points before, and therefore we have a lot of them. Quadrant four are the people who don't have good SAT scores, but have good admission points. So if we switch to admission points, what will happen is we will stop accepting these people, and we will accept these people. Okay, you can't say it's higher or lower, because you could claim it's lower because we'll admit some students that we now reject, but we'll also be rejecting some students we now admit. It'll be a little bit different. Next. Uh, region one, region three, okay. So, next. Uh, interesting cases two and four. We already talked about that. Next. What do we know? In fall 2012, uh, we had a different president, different admissions director, different provost. We were trying to solve this problem of not enough students enrolling by saying, well, what happens if we relax the standards a bit? So we admitted some students with, uh, let's say, a wider variety of, of uh, qualities than we used to. Uh, so. In this group, we can actually s compare how the students in the different zones did because we can go back and see what their scores, SAT <coughs> scores were. We can go back and see what their admission points were. Uh, 29 students with below 4,000 admission points, but over 1,000 SAT. So the average SAT among these people that we would reject, we rely on admission points with something like 11 something. Uh, their first year GPA is 2.32, not so good. Uh, 10 students with below 1,000 SAT, but over 4,000 admission points, you know, the people we now accept, their GPA is 2.81. Not great, <laughs> but okay, right? They did okay. Next. Uh, most students with high SAT scores are going to have the high admission points and vice versa. The two things go together, most of the time. Uh, two measures go, uh, you know, we'll make some different decisions. We can't say it's higher or lower. Okay. Next. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That's covering my butt. Okay. Um, what else we need to do? We have to look at every single file. We can't just say, okay, here's your number, you're in. Nope, there's your bad number, you're out. We have to look at every single file. Uh, we are also going to develop uh, Skype or telephone interviews with every applicant. Uh, some people have said, oh, what about people who can falsify their transcripts from high school and stuff? Well, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure they wouldn't be falsifying them already because, you know, we asked them to send you high school transcripts. 
uh, if somebody falsifies their high school transcript, then they still have to falsify the TOEFL score. And then somehow they have to falsify their interview by being able to you know, correspond with us in English, even though they can't. Um, I'm not that worried about it personally, because you know, if somebody totally falsifies everything in order to get in, they'll flunk out. You know, why? Um, we will still accept SAT scores. It's not like we are rejecting the SAT and throwing them all in a fire and burning them all. If you think your academic record from high school or your TOEFL score or whatever it is we're looking at is not strong enough, you want to take the SAT and, and convince us? Fine, we'll be convinced. Uh, we'll take that into consideration, but it's not going to be the one number that we use to accept or reject anymore. Uh, in fact, we'll probably make the minimum SAT somewhat higher because if we're accepting you because of your SAT, despite your low admission points, and we already know that low admission points are a stronger indicator of weak performance, uh, we probably need more convincing than just a 1020 SAT. Because that just says, you know, you're probably one of these people that we're gonna have, to have trouble with for four years. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, so, but, you know, there may be, you may be attending a school where it's very, very hard to get good grades, but they do a really great job of you preparing. So you have your so-so high school GPA, but you take the SAT and you get 1300. Okay, I'm convinced, okay. Um, this will allow us to change our financial aid and scholarship mechanisms to adjust. We have to do that anyway. Faculty will have to do some testing of students when you arrive on campus to sort out people who need Math 100, sort out people who might need English 100. We'll need to figure out exactly who we have when we have them on campus, but you know, life will go on. And that's it. Questions? Okay, thank you Professor Sullivan for your presentation. We're now going to open the floor for questions. Please, uh, all those who have questions, uh, uh, raise your Can I ask just you to direct the traffic? So okay. that way I don't have to flip papers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, first, we're going to go with Bori, then with Vessi. Bori? You mentioned so many times that uh, admission points is a stronger indicator. However, you've looked at the pool of people who have already taken the SAT, so you don't know if admission points would actually work with the population who has not taken the SAT. And then you stated that if you have, for example, bad grades in school, but you have a really good SAT, you'd be convinced and you'd admit that person. But in one of the previous graphs, some people had a really good SAT but low admission points, and then you said that we're not going to accept them. That's true. I mean, the, so which one is true? It's the same situation. It is true. I'm saying that a minimally acceptable SAT score, if you have low admission points, does not convince me. But if you get a clearly acceptable SAT score and your admission points are maybe a little bit below the threshold, then I could be convinced. Thank you. Bessie? So I have applied to schools in Europe, in the States, in Bulgaria. And my biggest concern with dropping the SAT but just keeping the application as it is is, first of all, are you going to consider a holistic approach that requires more than just one essay with application? Because even in the UK, that has a pretty standard system the UK has with a mm -hmm. single essay. Certain schools that are more high demanding, they have supplements that they want with their application. And the other very important thing for me is, are you going to reconsider the score for the TOEFL? Because I really personally consider that 80 is just really low for an application. Uh, Okay, two parts of your question. Let me see yeah, if I can. Uh, the, the, let me do, take care of the TOEFL first. Yeah. Uh, 80 TOEFL is a minimum. At the moment, under our current system, as long as you're above 80, done and done. Okay? And as far as that, we don't consider having a 90 or 100 makes you better or more attractive than having an 81. Uh, under the new system, you must have at least an 80, but the further above 80, the better. And so the TOEFL is part of the admission points. So if, you're, if your TOEFL is just barely acceptable, then you're probably a low admission points person. So you're less likely to be accepted. So the new system actually places more emphasis on the TOEFL than our current, than our previous one does. Uh, the second, uh, whether or not we're gonna take a more holistic approach, absolutely. Uh, one of the trustees said, uh, if you go in this direction from now on, you're gonna have to know every single one of your applicants. You have to talk to them. You have to evaluate their, their ability to write. Uh, you have a chance to uh, find out uh, you know, why they want to come. Are they the kind of student who's going to sit in a residence hall room and study for four years and you know, graduate and disappear? Are they going to be very much involved in the life of the campus? Are they going to be involved in clubs, activities, student government, sports, et cetera, et cetera? We're going to find out something about them through the interview process and so on and so forth. So I think in the end we'll know more about them when we're done. And I think in the end we'll be able to make 
better informed decisions. Will it work perfectly the first time? I can't promise you that it will, because you're doing something unknown. Thank you so much. Before we go with the next question, the Director of Permissions is also present here, so you can address questions to her as well. Any other questions at this point of time? Anya? Uh, I have a question regarding the admission points. So can you elaborate more on the system? What do you think into account and what is more important when you get points? Uh, I don't want to... <coughs> Yes, I can. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> part of the problem with the existing system, with the SAT, is its very clarity encourages applicants to try to game the system. Uh, because we, uh, for a while we were saying 1,350 on the SAT gets you a full scholarship, uh, we would have students taking the SAT once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, 1320, 1330, 1310, 1340, again and again and again until they get their 1350. Um, that tells me two things. One is that student really, really wanted to come to AEPG. <laughs> and two, that student really, really wanted a full scholarship. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, the difference between a full scholarship and what you might have had otherwise, you know, a 60% maybe financial aid award, is uh, $16,000. So is it worth $16,000 to retake the test? Yes. Um, did that help AUBG any? It certainly made the College Board richer. Uh, they run the SAT. Um, but I don't know if it does anything to us. I don't know if retaking the SAT makes you better prepared for college. Um, I don't think so, really. And so all the taking and retaking and re-retaking and re-re-retaking I think is a waste of time and money for a lot of people. And I would rather not have people doing that, particularly if it's you know to, to, to sort of climb the financial aid ladder in some way. Uh, because every student who's successful doing that means that somehow we have to get the same amount of money from you know somebody else in the, in the audience. And you know for, for the amount of money we need to collect from all students has to be enough to balance our budget. And so if one student pays less, that means somewhere somebody else has to pay more. That's, I mean, that's just the simple arithmetic of it. So that part of it, I'm, I would be happy to do away with. I think the admission points are harder to change because the TOEFL score is not the most important thing. I mean, you can raise your TOEFL score if you retake it from 85 to 90. That'll raise your admissions points some, but not enough to vault you all the way up to full scholarship. I mean, it's just not likely to happen. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna, first I had a question from over there in the dark shirt, then we're gonna go with dark, Raleigh. Dark go shirt ahead. guy, dark yeah. shirt guy, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you want to increase the pool of your prospective students, why don't you accept both TOEFL and SAT scores? We do accept them. But like equally, not only requiring the TOEFL um, as a mandatory test to apply. Uh, okay, at the moment, we waive the TOEFL if somebody submits an SAT that has a critical reading score above 600. 600. So if your critical reading score in the SAT is above 600, we say, okay, we're pretty sure you know English. <laughs> okay, you don't have to submit the TOEFL. But the TOEFL by itself is about your ability to uh, understand and speak English. It doesn't really even pretend to be anything about uh, your academic potential. And when we've looked at the ability of the TOEFL score to predict academic performance, it's worse than the SAT. So we can't rely only on the TOEFL to, to evaluate incoming students. It, it just doesn't work. Uh, and we also know, however, from past experience that if we admit students with, to I mean, uh, a score, I mean, you're, you're worried about the 80 TOEFLs. I mean, there have been a few times where we've admitted students with TOEFLs in the 70s or 60s. Uh, the performance of students, you know, not recently, but, um, but performance of students with weaker TOEFLs drops off dramatically if we admit students with lower TOEFLs because, you know, duh, the student doesn't understand English. And so if you don't understand English, you know, you're going to have a hard time understanding what your professors are telling you to do. Uh, so we need to be sure, first of all, the student understands and can converse in English well enough to get by, but we also need to know something about the student's academic potential. 
And the TOEFL just doesn't pretend to do that. Okay, I would like to ask you, is there an official research in particular regarding Bulgarian students as it to the youth board candidates, regarding what are the factors, the predominant factors they consider when they apply to universities in Bulgaria and in the UK, for example, what is our biggest competitor? Is it cost? Is it the admissions process that is easier? Is it the opportunities or is it just that people don't know about the UG? Yes. <laughs> no, uh, we have done uh, an image study uh, a few years ago, uh, targeted at uh, students in language schools, uh, upper to middle class or better incomes, in urban areas, with professional parents. In other words, the the type of parents and the type of students who are likely to be looking at English language uh, university experiences. Uh, what we found out was. Uh, this pool of people did not, that most of them had heard of ABG. Uh, they had this vague idea that we were too expensive, but, but very few of them had really any clear idea of how expensive it was or had no idea really what we taught or what we were, what we were about. None of them understood liberal arts or the American difference between American style education or European. Uh, they had this vague idea that they want uh, prestigious education and, and they associate that with UK. And ABG is just sort of out there as this other thing that they've heard about but don't know much about. That's what we heard. Uh, that was the conclusion of the image study, and we have to overcome that. Uh, and part of what we hear from the students is, these are the high school students, uh, it's a tough job to convince them that anything in Bulgaria could be any good. And so the in Bulgaria part of our name turns off a lot of the potential students. Other questions? Uh, sorry. Uh, first, we're, first, we're going to go here, then Diana, and then you're going to go. Thank you. My question is based on when are you going to distribute the scholarship. Let's say right now we have a standard 1350 on the SAT, mm -hmm. and you get a full scholarship. What would be the indicator in the future? Let's say, in other words, if you have the interview with the person and you get the feeling this person doesn't have an extremely good TOEFL score and extremely good GPA in high school, but this person is social and you have the feeling that this person is going to do well in social life in the UPG and he, he or she is going to be involved. Is, this can be a huge indicator for the scholarship or no? Direct answer to your question, I don't know yet whether or not we would consider all these social issues as, as part of a scholarship indicator. Uh, if we had a, you know, scholarships are awarded by, according to two criteria. One is if the donor says, I want to support students with these characteristics, then we try to follow what the donor's wish is. So if the donor says, I want to support uh, left-handed students from southern Albania who are very social, that's what we'll try to find, okay? Because we want to keep the donor happy, okay? Because if somebody gives you $10,000 for full scholarship, you want to keep them happy so they'll give another $10,000 the next year. Um, the other thing is, if the donor says, just go get the best students, then we look for the students with the best academic qualifications in whatever way we're assessing academic qualifications. So if a donor wants us to uh, specifically support uh, community engagement, we do that. We have donors that specifically are interested in students who are interested in sports, we do that. We have uh, in all the named scholarships, uh, a lot of them have you know, particular, I'm, I'd like to support a student you know, from this country who's doing this or is majoring in that, and we try to find the student that matches up with what the donor likes. If it's just a generic scholarship funds, we're trying, for the most part, trying to identify uh, the strongest academic students. Thank you. Hmm? The pool. Yes, yes, among the pool of applicants. Yeah. Diana? I have a question to Mr. M. Uh, how strong did admission points rely on SAT score? Maybe SAT score is part of admission points, that's why <coughs> that's the reason of the successful? The, the, the admission points do not rely on the SAT score okay, at all. No, thank yeah. you. Okay, next question. I got my answer. Okay, <laughs> anyone else? Uh, we're going to go with. Bori, then, then we're going to go with Anna Maria, and then we're going to go with Bessie. Bori? Okay, so um, you say you want to improve education in ABG in general. It's, I mean, you're trying to get more people here so that we have more money, so that we can get more professors and have more variety. So in general, as a summary, just to improve um, our quality of education. But have you considered that it's not just the number of people or how much they have to pay? It's also what reputation we have. 
because I've done an extensive research and I have never found any uh, university ranking where AUBG is the best in Bulgaria. I'm talking about world ranking. There is always another Bulgarian university above us or we don't even exist in this university ranking. So, I mean, I heard it so many times that we are the best university in Bulgaria and obviously I'm here, so I believe it. But there is no ranking that I've seen that confirms it. Uh, go to the Bulgarian Ministry of Education She's official about rankings. International rankings. Okay. Yeah. International rankings. Uh, I went to a conference uh, in June about multi rank, which is the pan European university rankings thing. Uh, I had a long, bitter talk with the guy who's presenting the uh, methodology of it because basically his point was if your university has less than 10,000 students, you don't exist and you're not, never going to appear in our rankings. So it precludes any small school from ever presenting itself as having high quality. He says, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, it was present at some places. Let's not interfere in the speaking mind of a uh, speaker. Does, are you finished with your answer? Yes, yes yeah, so? yeah. Okay. so we're, we're never going to appear in the, in the international rankings just because of scale. <laughs> They're only interested in large institutions. Uh, the Bulgarian rankings, even, in, even within Bulgaria, in some of our programs don't appear because they're too small, but we are uh, ranked number one of all universities in Bulgaria as far as academic success for our graduates. We're, uh, our economics program is the top ranked one in Bulgaria. Uh, percentage of graduates uh, employed in the professional fields, we're also number one. Uh, you know, within Bulgaria, the rankings are generally supportive. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, they, I will say this, well, no, I shouldn't say it because it's reported here. Okay, no, I won't say it. Okay, uh, Anna Maria had the question, but before I give the floor, <coughs> please bear in mind that priority will be given to speakers who haven't taken the floor, especially for, for two times when I'm distributing the questions. Anna Maria. Uh, you said that you're going to base your measuring students from uh, GPA and also at take home interviews. And I was wondering whether you consider also to substitute the TAT test with a internal test that you're going to make for students because essays and interviews are very subjective criteria of admission in my opinion. Yeah, interviews are subjective, uh, but they can be ranked uh, and scored objectively if you train the interviewers. Uh, we have thought of using internally developed tests, but internally developed tests have the same uh, weaknesses of uh, SAT and then some new ones uh, that we don't have a benchmark to evaluate what's a minimum acceptable score. We'll have no history to uh, rely on to evaluate whether or not you know, we should make the minimum score this or that. Um, and we'll inherit all the difficulties of getting uh, the applicants actually to take the test. Uh, keep in mind we're not just going to Sofia and Blago Garden Star and Zagora, we're going to Ulan Bator and uh, places such as that. So, I mean, uh, administering a test and, and you know, so we say, okay, we don't really want to send somebody to Ulan Bator, so we'll do it remotely by uh, email, then you don't really know exactly who's filling out the bubbles uh, at the other end. And so, you know, there's all kinds of problems with trying to use our own test. I mean, we have thought about it, but there's lots of problems that we haven't figured out a solution to. Thank you. Betsy had a question. Two parts of the thing, I'm sorry. Uh, the first part is, uh, the risk to offend some people, but people come from different high schools and the quality of the high schools is different. So, yep. for example, my high school GPA wasn't that great, much lower than what I have now here, and but my school was very demanding and some other schools are not as much. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question would be, how are you gonna, are you at all gonna evaluate the yes. person, like the high school where the person is coming from and how? Mm -hmm. And also regarding the interviews, if you get to the 2,000 candidates they used to have, how are you going to manage physically to execute all these interviews? Because it sounds a little bit... How many people do you have working in your office? Nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the first part, uh, the, the different standards of high schools, uh, that question has been raised before, and I think I have a method of trying to get at it, but not a result yet, which is uh, Oriana and her team if there's anybody who can give me the list of which high schools in Bulgaria are really the top ones where your concern would be something to think about, they should know because they're the high schools that we go to try to recruit students from. 
and also perhaps even in Albania and, and the other regional countries where, where we recruit all the time. So I said to me, if there are some really, really top high schools where a student with sort of average grades is still a great student, give me that list of schools. And then I can go back to my database of all students in all years for the last five years and say, I'll have 100 students from these schools. And then I'll say, would I get a different uh, prediction equation from these schools than I get from all the other schools? And if so, how much of a difference should that be? And so if that pans out, then we can say, if you're from that super duper first language school in Sofia country, did I guess it right? No, I okay. said Okay, <laughs> you don't want to say, okay. If you're from the super duper first language school in Sofia or something, that's worth another 100 admission points, okay? If, if, the data if the data supports that, but I don't know yet if it does. Any other questions at this point of time? Uh, Kalina? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, actually, I just want to add to her question. For example, I graduated from high school with extensively studying fine arts in French and Marty here, graduated with mathematics and English. Yeah. So how is this going to compare and how is this going to correlate and be adequately represented in the admission form? Uh, I've got a patty answer for you, which because somebody asked the same question last week. Mm -hmm. uh, do you ever compare your GPA to your friends? Yeah. At ABG? Yeah. <laughs> Do you all take the same courses from the same professors? <laughs> Maybe not. Is, you, is, yeah, is, is your A in introduction to music the same thing as an A in intermediate micro? <laughs> Answer no, but we do it anyway, right? Uh, the data is the best data that I have. It could be better. Yeah, and, and as we look at it and as we know what we're looking for and as we learn how better to sift it, it will be better. But even as, even with, you know, your, and your objection is absolutely right, even with all those objections, it's still working to predict success better than the SAT does. Proof is in the pudding, as they say. Okay, any other questions? Nare, you, and then, wait, Anna, and then you. Nare, go ahead. Okay, I have a question, a rhetorical question for everyone. Did anyone here who was studying for the SAT feel while you were studying or when you were taking the test that it was in any way going to show your academic potential? Anyone? I didn't get the question. Get the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rhetorical yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah. So while you were studying for it, did you feel like, um, this is really the right way for me to show that I'm going to be a good student. I didn't even, most people I spoke to didn't. It is. Okay. One, one, please, one speaker, one speaker at a time. Thank you for your... Wait, wait, one speaker at a time. Uh, now we're going to go, first I give the floor to Diana. Diana, was it? Not Diana. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Richard, <laughs> you have the floor. Richard, yeah, yeah. Richard. Yeah. 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 Okay, so my question is, what about kind of data, the high school data is unavailable? And I'm not saying it's a widespread case, but for example, in my case, I come from the high school in Kosovo that is strictly against the EBT. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Send us an SAT score. We, we are not saying and have never said that we're gonna take everybody's SAT score and throw them into the furnace. If somebody sends us an SAT score, and particularly in a case like yours where you know, we can't get any information from the high school, then we still have to make an evaluation. We'll still talk to you and we'll say, oh, you know, he's articulate, uh, he's got a good score. You know, will it destroy you know, Western civilization if we admit him? I don't think so, let's give him a try. So we're going to first go with Dana, Lori, and then Green Shirt. You already had the floor once, so we're trying to have, but still we're trying to have as much many people to speak, even for once. It's my, my question is just really quick, because the deadline for applying for Spring 2015 is November 1st, right? Yeah. They, the students that are going to apply for Spring 2015 are going to be, well, I mean, their applications are going to be listed under the old rule or the new rule? Excellent question, and I don't know the answer right now, uh, because a lot of the Spring 15 applicants are in ELI. 
uh, taking the prep course, and the prep course was designed to help them meet the SAT standard. So changing that standard on them could be very unfair. One more question, yeah. yeah. What happens to your wife? Uh, ELI, we can, we can, we'll have to have some conversations with them, but uh, just as there are students who need help uh, meeting the SAT standards, uh, there may be students who need some help because they fall just short of the admission point standards and they need some extra help in preparation in that way. So we'll have to reformulate it, but you know the, the need will still be there. Lori? Uh, I would ask, to, I would like to ask the chair that we get the discussion to an end because classes are coming so much at 30, so when it has class, we will take into that. That's a, that's a point we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the discussion discussion shortly due to some logistical issues. However, I'm uh, as I give the floor before to someone else, as I stated the the order that who will take the speak. I'm gonna entertain three more questions at this point of time. First, we're gonna go with as already being given to Green. Point of order. If there is a motion to postpone the discussion to the next meeting, they should be voting. Yeah. True that. That's that's in order. But still, the amount that, that is given, granted to SG meeting is still 545. That was Laura's point. Uh, so it's 15 minutes, minutes at least. No, minutes. Moreover, moreover, if people are willing to ask questions, I do prefer to let them ask all these questions. And if you personally have to leave, that's why we have the vice chair of the Senate who should stay here and take your place. I didn't say that I have to leave. Please, let's keep this concise and let's go with the questions for now. Point of order. First of all, if, no matter what, if, they made a, if there was a motion made by Senate, they should be a voting. And secondly, some people have a midterm at main building and they need at least 15 minutes to get there. Right. <laughs> Granted. Are there any points or motions at the floor at this point of time? Mother Laura? I raise a motion to postpone the discussion for another time. So for next week. For next week. Any seconds to this? Next week is the full day. Next meeting. Any seconds? So we are now having a motion to table the debate on this point for the next meeting. Uh, anyone who would like to take the floor for discussions from the senators or the officers? Yes, Ruben? We would have promised to be able to attend during the next meeting. I am always at the service of SG. <laughs> <laughs> Mario? Even if you adjourn the meeting, I would still encourage all the people who are interested in that issue to stay here for a little bit more. You can, I think, Provost Sullivan and Burian Shalaska will be eager to stay here and answer all your questions, so it doesn't have to be in the minutes for you guys to get your answers. So, if the senators and I still government have to leave, okay, but I will kindly invite you to stay here and get your answers.